In Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, the curious Alice climbs through the mirror above the chimney. At first, the image in the mirror looked just like the living room. But as it is with mirrors, once on the other side, Alice finds everything inverted. The books are written backward, and when Alice asks for a glass of water, she is handed a dry cookie. As she advances further into the mirror, she encounters strange creatures that do not seem to have any counterparts in the real world. And on top of that, the fantastical creatures are also rude. When Alice tells them that she is from the real world and that they are only mirror images, the creatures disagree and tell Alice that she is, in fact, only imagined and that their world is the real world. Let's summarize the functions of the mirror according to Lewis Carroll. A mirror shows us an image of the world. There is confusion about which side of the mirror is the real world. The mirror inverts all the things of the real world. But sometimes there are things in the mirror that look overall different and don't seem to have any counterpart. And there are only two sides of the mirror. All of these strange facts build the basis of the metaphysics of formal logic. Lewis Carroll has read George Boole's Laws of Thought and was quite familiar with the topic. The functions attributed to the mirror may seem to be paradoxical and arbitrary at first, but we can make sense of it with a little help from Ludwig Wittgenstein and by putting together one-valued ontology, two-valued logic and representationalism. What is shown to the mirror is being. The investigation of being is called ontology. According to the famous logician Willard Quine, the question posed in ontology is a simple one. What is? And the answer is even simpler. It is everything. Philosophers call it the real world, being or archetype. Since the real world already encompasses everything, there is only one of it. It is a one-valued ontology. There is only one reality. You can find as many parallel universes as you like. In one-valued ontology, they will all be fused into one world that is being. In the history of philosophy, the origin of one-valued ontology is usually traced back to the ancient Greek philosopher Parmenides. In his poem On Nature, he assures us over and over again that being is and nothingness is not. And only the two-headed people would be so unwise as to claim that there can be something else. Mixing the two realms creates opinion and illusion, while only the reflection of the unity of being leads to truth. In ancient philosophy, the real world was referred to as the archetype. According to Platonism, the archetype repeats itself in a copy. Yet, since the real world is already defined as everything there is, the image can only contain what is already present in the archetype. However, there can be imperfections in the mirror that deform the mirror images. And these deformed images have a dubious ontological status. Being exists while nothingness does not. Yet the mixture of both does somehow exist but really shouldn't. This is where a second value comes into play that will allow us to clearly separate two opposites. One-valued ontology is accompanied by a two-valued logic. There are only two kinds of thoughts, true thoughts and false thoughts. And there are only two ways of relating to the world, affirmatively and negatively. Both of these facts can be expressed in formal logic. Formal logic provides two loci, let's call them A and non-A. And it provides us with an operation to get from one side to the other and back again, negation. By negating A, we will get non-A and vice versa. Both sides are then assigned a value. We will use the symbols 0 and 1 for them. On the abstract level, these symbols have no specific meaning and just exist to distinguish the two sides. They are arbitrary markers that we use to remember to which side of the world something belongs. But usually they are either interpreted as positive and negative or true and false. The positive-negative distinction is symmetrical and refers to the fact that the mirror image is inverted. And a true-false distinction is hierarchical and refers to the fact that, although we do not know which side is real, one of them has to be the real world. 
This real world is superior since it is totally independent of its mirror image, while the mirror image cannot exist without the real world. Any proposition can either be affirmative or negative. The flower is red or the flower is not red. On second thought, there seems to be no symmetry here. Red only means red, but not red can mean so many things. Yet logicians are undeterred. A and non-A are perfectly symmetrical. This is also what Ludwig Wittgenstein says in his statement 5.513 of the Tractatus. Every proposition has only one negative, because there is only one proposition which lies altogether outside it. If you are not inside the room, you must be outside of it. And if you do not agree that the flower is red, you are simply stating that the flower is not red. But it gets even more abstract. In the case of the red flower, we can claim to know which proposition is positive and which is negative. Yet, on a strictly formal level, this is not possible. This fact was pointed out by the German logician Gottlob Frege. In his writings he admitted that he does not know which one of the following statements is positive or negative. Christ is immortal. Christ lives forever. Christ does not live forever. Christ is not immortal. And Christ is mortal. The word not cannot be used as an indicator of negativity in itself. We tend to say that the sentence, the flower is not red, is negative, because, for us, not red encompasses a variety of different colors. But in formal logic, this is abstracted to create symmetry. Thus, a statement and its negation are structurally identical. The negation operator can be universally applied to anything. There is nothing that cannot be negated. The positive world and the negative world are the same size. Each element on one side corresponds to exactly one element on the other side. Both sets have the same cardinality. In mathematics you would call this a one-to-one -one and onto correspondence or bijection. Ludwig Wittgenstein repeats it in statement 4.0621 of his Tractatus. That, however, the signs P and non-P can say the same thing is important for it shows that the sign for the negator corresponds to nothing in reality. The proposition P and not P have opposite senses, but to them corresponds one and the same reality. The reality of one-valued ontology is neither positive nor negative, nor is it true or false. It is just real. Only the mirror image can be positive or negative and true or false. Propositions can be true or false only by being pictures of the reality. When we look at propositions and call them true or false, we have the same situation. A sentence can describe a red flower as being red. It is a true sentence. But I can also say the flower is blue, green, yellow and so on. These sentences are false. Again, there seems to be no symmetry here. Only one sentence is true, while there is a myriad of sentences about the same thing that are false. This fact is easily explained in the theory of imagery or representationalism. People are imperfect beings. When they try to create a mirror image, they fail all the time. Since there is an infinite number of ways a person can be wrong, you will need to mobilize more theories to explain why so many people have the same false thoughts. But no one needs to explain why two people who know the truth have the same thoughts about the same subjects. If S1 equals O and S2 equals O, it follows that S1 equals S2. All thinking comes to rest in this truth. As long as the ego is thinking, it is moving from one error to the next. History is known as the ordeal of lost souls. By becoming one with the truth, the philosopher exits the historical world. Truth is static. Anything else would violate the law of identity. The combination of one-valued ontology and two-valued logic is represented in the so-called three laws of thought. The law of identity, the law of contradiction and the tertium non datur. The first axiom of logic tells us what the object of thought is. 
It is self-identical, monovalent, static being of one-valued ontology that exists for itself in a transcendent realm that is independent of thinking. Self-identity is not a property that an object can have. It is a precondition. To say that something is identical to itself is equivalent to saying that it is a single, isolated object. It would be ludicrous to blame the object for my false image of it. Everything that is untrue depends on the subject and will disappear with it. But truth is independent of thought and, therefore, eternal. The second law tells us what cannot be the object of thinking. A contradiction negates the identity of objects with themselves. In order to think an object, any contradiction has to be absent. Contradictions are illogical. One cannot think of an object that is a square and a circle at the same time. Aristotle argued that anyone who wants to oppose the law of contradiction could only do so by saying that it is wrong. But when he is saying something, he is at the same time not saying the opposite and therefore subjected to the law of contradiction. Someone who opposes the law of contradiction can, therefore, only stay silent. Arguing with such a person, Aristotle said, would make as much sense as arguing with a plant. An Aristotelian philosopher from Persia had a quite different approach. He suggested punching a person who argues against the law of contradiction until he admits that there is a fundamental difference between being punched and not being punched. Fortunately, nowadays, most logicians will only use nonviolent proofs. The third law states that a third alternative is excluded. The symmetric two-valuedness cannot be broken. As mentioned before, the positive and the negative world have the same cardinality, and the only logical operation that gets you out of one world is negation. There is no other alternative. The third law is kind of odd, because you have to be able to think of the possibility of a third alternative to exclude it explicitly. So, it's no surprise that, in the history of philosophy, the third law is the most contested one. But questioning the validity of only one of the three laws is a delicate matter. Philosophers noticed that the three laws kind of say the same thing and are not so easily separated. And with the help of the Morgan, we can prove it. Of course, it will only work if you accept our way of formalizing the laws. Some philosophers saw the limits of this approach and the dead-end street you enter when you take formal logic to be identical to metaphysics. They criticized it in the name of becoming, the greater power of negativity, the greater depth of nothingness, or third alternatives. The critics either turned their attention to more poetic and intuitive styles of philosophy, or they invented complex philosophical systems with new operators that were supposed to show a way out of the constant back and forth between the symmetrical sides of the mirror. But actually, we have to look no further than Lewis Carroll's Humpty Dumpty. Goodbye till we meet again, she said as cheerful as she could. I shouldn't know you again if we did meet, Humpty Dumpty replied in a discontented tone, giving her one of his fingers to shake. You're so exactly like other people. The face is what one goes by, generally, Alice remarked in a thoughtful tone. That's just what I complain of, said Humpty Dumpty. Your face is the same as everybody has. The two eyes, so, nose in the middle, mouth under. It's always the same. Now, if you had the two eyes on the same side of the nose, for instance, or the mouth at the top, that would be of some help. It wouldn't look nice, Alice objected. But Humpty Dumpty only shut his eyes and said, Wait till you've tried. <laughs>